Welcome back to Stars and Miss. After the episode on Alcor, we'll delve into fundamental unsolved problems in mythology. Here, I want to explain the general features of myth motives distribution on the globe using this simple model that furnishes surprisingly good results. In the last episode, we uncovered a great puzzle about myths. How do myths appear, propagate, and disappear in the world? The renowned anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss was among the first to analyze myths almost mathematically. My interest in Claude Lévi-Strauss stemmed from his pioneering work in reducing complex observation into a model. He went so far as to mathematically model the transformation in formulas like the one here, which we are still trying to understand and analyze today. There's a reference to it on the last slide. The four-book series titled Mythologic is a fascinating intellectual adventure. Starting from an Amazonian Borobo myth, he showed the many transformations of the myths in America but also on other continents. Levi Strauss has greatly influenced the study of myths, folk tales, and my work. I am a physicist, and physicists tend to appreciate models and abstraction. Models aim at capturing as many observations as possible with the fewest parameters. A model is an abstraction, not reality, and a good model can be proven wrong or improved upon. I've already mentioned Yuri Bereskin database. Elements in the database have been largely compiled over the past two centuries. They provide a snapshot of the global distribution of missed motive. One observes that many motives appear in few traditions and a few motives are found in many traditions. Let's play how we process the data with a sketch, and then I will show you the real data. The top right insert shows a world map, and each red point corresponds to one instance in which one motive, here we have chosen the plaid and the cuckoo, was recorded. The motive is part of a story recorded by the Grimm's brothers in Germany. To make the story short, the husband quarreled with his wife, he became a cuckoo, and his wife and children became the Pleiades. Now, recall the red dots indicate the motive occurrence in the various traditions. There are four such instances in the database. Now, let's look at the graph. The motive of the plied and the cuckoo appears at one dot in the corresponding bin with four instances. Then we repeat it with the 2,200 other motives. They are processed similarly. And at the end, one counts the number of points in each bin. For the motive of the plied as person, one has, for instance, 164 motive, which is quite a lot. So we see the curve, and now let's examine the real data. Here you see the real data, and many motives are found in a few traditions, and a few are really widespread. Let's note for the moment that there is an overproportionate number of sky motives among those with more than 150 instances. We'll come back to that point in, in a further episode. I've done my PhD on percolation. Percolation was originally the science of making good coffee by adjusting the grain size and allowing water to percolate through the grain. I was therefore well aware that the recorded curve is typical of related models, called either contact model or birth and death model. And I adapted this model to a problem. Let's describe the model. 
We model the different tradition on the Earth using a square grid. This is in a, an oversimplification made by many researchers. The model contains three components, each described by a distinct probability. At some random location, a new motif appears. Corresponding tradition becomes active for that motif and appears here color in blue. There's a probability, call it PB, that the motif propagate to one of its neighbor, shown by here the arrows. If it does, then the cell becomes active because a neighbor has adopted the motif, as indicated by the light blue squares in the right image. A second process corresponds to the independent emergence of the same motive in a different part of the world. For instance, a motive may appear whenever the conditions are right. The probability of the process is PE, and the blue square on the right illustrates this. Finally, a motif might disappear from a tradition with some probability PD, D like death or disappearance, and the disappearance of the black square from the grid illustrates this. Importantly, such model leads to dynamics that depend very little on the model details. The model makes very few assumptions. Main assumption is that the number of motif in the world stay constant. Let us use the first result and compare them to the real data. A red curve corresponds to the model. It closely fits the real curve in blue. However, it diverged slightly for motifs found in only a few traditions, possibly because the database doesn't include all the many motifs with fewer than five traditions. Because the model uses probabilities, we cannot predict the exact fate of every single motive. However, the model allows us to understand the over overall patterns and dynamics on how myths distribute over time and across many traditions. One judge a model by its explanatory and predictive power. A model, despite its simplicity, Furnish, so furnishes surprisingly good result as you hear. Once you hear the best fit for the motif count distribution. After the in model initial success in predicting the distribution of motif, let us examine whether it can also describe other properties such as their geographic distribution. Are myths found in one dense cluster? or how they spread across the globe in many small disconnected groups? The first answer is that the distribution is not very dense. Let's provide an example with a motif commonly associated with primeval, primeval times when several sun burned the earth. A small red circle with that motif is drawn around each tradition. It's note that the circle becomes an ellipse ones projected on the map. A cluster corresponds to the connected red circles. And when we run the simulation for all 2,200 motifs and compare it to the real world data, what do we find? You can see on the graph, our simple model does an excellent job of matching the geographic clustering of MIS. The model match the clustering of real data met almost perfectly. This gives us a great confidence that the model captures some essential feature of this motive. Let's note that the best fit was found using a model with only two components, birth by contact and death or disappearance. The third component, independent emergence, is not necessary here. Let us address some criticism of the model. Well, it might be perceived as oversimplified, 
as it treats all motives and traditions identically. Another possible related criticism is that it ignores myths, sacred and existential dimension by focusing exclusively on abstract structure. It also overlooks one important question, such as the socio-economic condition that determine which motives become uh, uh, significant. If we'd done it, the model would have become intractable as a quantitative description of this aspect is not feasible. Ultimately, a too complex model would have been less accurate than the simple approach because it would, it would have introduced much uncertainty. A mathematical model of myths, motives, life cycle might be perceived as a Faustian approach to searching for hidden rules with an oversimplified view of the mythical world. However, understanding the distribution of motives may help preserve them. Some motives are dying and losing their complexity and richness with time. Identifying similar motives in neighboring tradition may be useful in reconstructing some lost aspect of ancient stories. The next episode will explore one central question. Do similar myths diffuse to their neighbors or appear independently at several locations? If the answer interests you, stay tuned. Bye. I want to especially my, mention my new book, Probing the Past with Data Analytics and AI, which contains one chapter on this topic. Thank you and bye-bye.